All right, so thanks. Let me get this started here. I think so, yeah, although it's, there we go. Okay. So my name's Mark Jacobson, I'm in the econ department. I'll go back to this. I'm gonna try to talk some today about, I was told to talk about efficiency, and so by efficiency, probably that means fuel efficiency, but I'm gonna sort of run with it and talk to you some about cost efficiency as well, uh, and policy and car choice. All right, so the first one is fuel efficiency. Uh, this goes back to 1955, and this is the, this is the scale I like uh, on the left. We're all used to seeing miles per gallon, that's on the right, so if you wanna kinda go over to miles per gallon, you can, but miles per gallon is not really what matters, right? What matters is how many gallons you have to use to go however far you drive, right? So on the left here, we've got gallons per 100 miles. So in the 50s, a uh, 100 mile trip took a little more than six gallons, then oil got really cheap and people started going for the big cars and we shot almost, we almost hit eight gallons for a 100 mile trip. Uh, and then there were the oil shocks in the 70s. Dramatic fall, right? Uh, so there's a point. We get this dramatic fall here uh, in the 70s. And then what happened here, this last little downturn, this was the fuel economy standard in the US. All right, so it piled on, okay? So there was this big drop uh, in consumption, the fuel economy standard piled on a little bit. What happens here? is gas is still cheap, the fuel economy standard is static, and people are trying to use more and they, they can't, right? So they're held down with the fuel economy standard here. You can see it goes up a little bit all the way through the 90s. This is the SUV and so on. Right, what's going on here? This is the recession and the new wave of high oil prices. And what are we doing? Well, just like we piled on last time, we're gonna pile on this time. And I think it's a great opportunity actually to try and uh, sort of hold things down for the future so this doesn't come back up. Right, if we get cheap fuels or cheap biofuels. Um, so this green line is where we're going to 2025. These are the standards Obama announced. We're sitting at about three, three and a half gallons uh, per 100 miles now, and we're gonna get down to two. Right. And if you see on the right scale, this is miles per gallon. The thing with miles per gallon, of course, is that the first few reductions from, or first few improvements from 14 to 17 or to 20 are saving huge amounts of fuel. The improvements from 30 to 50 or 50 to 100 actually save about the same amount as going from 14 or something to 17, right? So you have to, you have to uh, be aware this is a very nonlinear process, and, and the U.S. is just sort of stuck in miles per gallon. The rest of the world uh, tends to use liters per 100 kilometers, uh, which is like my, my linear metric on the, uh, on the left. Okay, so now on to cost efficiency, right? So we want to save gas. How do we do this most cheaply? Right? This is what the, the economists are often sort of tasked with. So one thing we can do is improve fuel efficiency. That's the previous slide, and we do that. Uh, we can increase biofuel use. It's another way to save, save gasoline. We'll hear lots more about that. Uh, but then there's all of these other things. Right? We can carpool. We can move closer to work. Right? Instead of living somewhere with a nice ocean view and driving to work, you could sacrifice a little bit and live close to work, say. Uh, you can ride public transit, combine trips, you know, plan ahead a little bit, don't take quite so many trips to Target this weekend, bicycle, walk, uh, and so on. Right? There's all these things uh, that, we can, uh, that we can do. And to be most cost effective at saving gasoline, we want to do two things. One, we're going to need to use all the channels. Right? We want to find the cheapest little reductions from all the channels. And the other thing is we're going to want to concentrate on whichever of these happens to be cheapest. And you'll notice that even within biofuels, there's lots of things, right? There's algae, there's corn, there's switchgrass. Okay, so within each channel, we're also trying to concentrate on the thing that is, that is cheapest, right? If we want to achieve cost efficiency. Right, what if there was one beautiful policy that could get uh, us to find the cheapest ways in all of these things, right? There is, economists have been talking about it for years and no one likes it, uh, but it's price, all right? So if we increase the price of gasoline, Maybe this weekend I won't take three trips to Target, I'll actually plan ahead a little bit. Or maybe I'll move closer to where I work, right? Or maybe I'll buy a more efficient car, or maybe I'll buy some biofuel made from algae. I'll do whatever the cheapest thing is I can do to get away from the, from the high cost of gasoline, right? And so the idea here is that in, in economic theory anyway, gas prices automatically search for, they get people to automatically search for the cheapest ways to save gasoline from amongst this huge array of things. Uh, that we can do. It's also possible that you could have a patchwork of regulation, so we can encourage biofuel, we can have fuel economy standards to encourage efficiency, 
We can pay people money to carpool or give them free parking passes. We can do the same thing for biking or walking to work. It's a little bit harder to see how we compensate people for things like combining trips, though, or moving closer to where they work. Right now, if I combine trips this weekend, the government doesn't give me anything. I have no incentive to do that, right? Um, uh, the, the government gives me pretty cheap cars, cheap gasoline, great roads. Uh, I don't have any incentive to do that, right? So we need this perfect patchwork of regulation. If we had that, we could get to the cheapest, these cheapest channels. Right? But of course, it's, it's very hard. It's almost impossible to get right. And so if you haven't gotten it quite right, so I'm telling you, they, they haven't gotten it right, right? Because nobody's trying to get me to combine trips, say. Uh, so because we don't have it right, we're going to get smaller gasoline savings than we could, or a greater cost, or of course, both, uh, some, some intermediate combination. All right, so in practice, though, what does this patchwork look like? Well, we've got lots of emphasis on car choice. I'll say a little bit more about that. And fuel efficiency, that's the CAFE standard. Biofuel mandates, building more public transit. We put lots of uh, resources into that. There are some incentives to carpool, bike to work, and stuff. And there are some things that are missed. Right? Um, and the fifth one that I was tempted to put on here just out of sort of spite or make a point, but I'll, I'll say it instead, is we spend a huge amount of money also building more lane miles and extending highways. Right? If, we're, uh, if we're doing that, what sort of message is that sending to people about how much we want them to drive? Right? So if, if we're really serious about saving gasoline, it's kind of one hand working against the other. Right? We're, we're building more public transit and, and trying to do these other things. At the same time, we make it easier and cheaper and better to drive and live much farther away from where we work by, by increasing the uh, road capacity. It's just a, a side point. So a bit more on, on cost efficiency and, and how exactly, is, think a little bit about how hard this is to do. I don't want to be too dismal an economist here, but uh, this is sort of the most optimistic we can get. So if you raise the price of gas from four, four bucks a gallon, like it is now, to about six dollars a gallon, and you turn all the revenue to the public um, in one way or another, uh, you could use it to reduce deficits or buy something the public wants or just give them cash checks. Uh, how much demand reduction are you going to get? Well, about 15%. I'm trying to be optimistic here. This is the long run. This is, this is sort of the most you could get for that, uh, that price change. Right, so now imagine that we want to achieve that same 15%, but instead of using this one policy that's finding the cheapest way to do it, all right, the $4 to $6, we're going to use a much more expensive patchwork to, to, get, to save that 15%. The cost on society is at least as big and probably much bigger than going from $4 to $6 per gallon gas, if you want to think about the, uh, the distortions in theory. Um, and in particular, there's lots of estimates, some in my own work. Uh, fuel economy standards probably cost about three times more than a tax per, per gallon of gasoline saved. And biofuel subsidies can cost even a lot more than CAFE. This is my bad news for the biofuel folks, uh, uh, per gallon of gasoline saved. And the reason for that is, is actually kind of intuitive. If we're subsidizing biofuel and blending it into gasoline, that's making the whole liquid fuel that we buy cheaper. Right? And when you make the whole liquid fuel that you buy a little cheaper, uh, you can potentially get people to drive more, which is the exact opposite, again, of what you, uh, what you want. Right? So you have to be real careful with, with subsidies. A couple silver linings. All right, so there are counter arguments, uh, of course, to all of this. Uh, an energy paradox. So what would happen if consumers are systematically regretting their car purchases? All right, so I go out, I'm thinking the Prius or the BMW 3 Series, and I just, I, I have to have the BMW 3 Series. Uh, I get it home, a couple years later, I really regret. I say, gee, uh, my gas bill is just much higher than I thought it would be, right? If that's true, systematically, then we can actually get gains from something like a fuel economy standard that makes Priuses more attractive. It tells the car companies, basically, you have to sell more Priuses somehow. That's the, that's the standard, and the car companies will offer discounts or incentives or whatever and get people to... Uh, to buy them. So that's one, one kind of silver lining. The other uh, is that technological progress can have tremendous spillovers. So if you put high enough subsidies on technology right now, they might look really inefficient, but in the future you can reap really great dividends from this. And this is particularly true if the technologies are kind of building on, on themselves uh, over time. Uh, I don't have, how am I doing on time? Is there a clock somewhere? Seven oh good, okay. Good shape. I'm going, well, that means I'm going too fast, probably. Okay. <laughs> All right. So on car choice. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about car choice. This is the first of these, uh, the first of these silver linings, right? Which was, uh, if people are systematically doing something wrong with their car choice, maybe fuel economy standards can can help them, right? Maybe we can actually get something for nothing, as it were, by improving the technology in, in cars. 
Right, so this is just my little test for the audience. So this is a Nissan Altima. It's uh, a mid-sized mid car. The 2013 version gets about 26 miles per gallon in actual real-world driving uh, on average. Let's and let's suppose we could increase that to 27. I had another one next to it, and the dealer tells you this one gets 27 and this one gets 26, but they're the same car. Otherwise, make some assumptions about how long it lasts. All right, uh, $4 gas. How much do we think that one mile per gallon is worth. Somebody throw it out. Why not have a little bit of audience interaction? I mean, just make a guess. $500. Oh, very close. It's worth about 700, right? So within plus or minus, depending on how you discount, it's worth about, about that, about 700. Right? What about uh, this Jeep Grand Cherokee? It gets about 60 miles per gallon uh, on, on uh, real world conditions. And we're just going to go to 17, so one mile per gallon, all right? This is one big reason why consumers could make mistakes, right? Uh, is that people often assume, oh, 16 to 17, 26 to 27, it's a mile per gallon. Somebody once told me in a seminar that that's worth $500 or $700. Uh, of course, on the Grand Cherokee, it's actually worth $1,800 to get that one mile per gallon. All right, and this is a very common mistake people make in their, in their car purchases. All right? And this can, this can um, uh, really sort of bias the decisions that we, that we might see. Okay? So to economists, to try to look for this and see what kinds of mistakes are people making, and maybe they're even systematic, right? Maybe people are even always buying or often buying the car that they then regret after they get it home and have to find out how much gas it uses, right? So to look for that, we actually can look in used car transactions. And there was a, a big paper that just came out uh, um, this year that did that. And the approach they took was they have individuals buying and selling used cars. And they wait for the price of gas to change a little bit. So when the price of gas goes up a little bit, it should be that I should be willing to pay a little more for a used Prius and a little less for a used uh, Grand Cherokee, say. And everybody in the market comes together, and the prices of these cars adjust. And if people, are, if people understand correctly uh, how much gas they're going to be burning, then the price of the car should move the, the, full, uh, the full amount right, of, that, uh, of that change. So what happened? Uh, exactly 100% of the fuel cost changes translate into used car prices. People are exactly correct uh, in how much they're willing to pay for used cars as the price of gas goes, uh, goes up and down a little bit. All right, and this is reproducible in lots of data. I actually have my own uh, data sets on used cars. I looked at it. I also got it's, it's really close to 100%. Right? Pe people understand how much gas they put in their cars. Right now, we might make an emotional decision. We might like that 3 Series more, more than we should, right, if we understood the environmental damage or something. But it looks like, at least economically, people understand how much gas they put uh, in their cars. Right? Again, there are some other views. EPA is right there at the top of the list with other views. Uh, and they argue that if we put these new gasoline-saving technologies in cars that are being effectively mandated by the new efficiency standards, that they'll pay for themselves in less than three years. This is the same thing as saying people are doing something wrong, right? If, if I could buy this technology now, and I can't because unless the government forces it on me, uh, but then I'll be thanking them in, in, in three years, right? So there's, there's sort of a disconnect here. Uh, there also is a fair amount of evidence that people do fall prey to the, the example I gave with the Altima and the Grand Cherokee. It's called mile per gallon illusion, that a mile per gallon might be worth the same amount when it's really not and they make poor choices. But interestingly, those poor choices tend to be on actually both sides. So people will see a, a going from a, uh, I can't remember, but say, say we have a Prius and something that gets five or 10 miles per gallon better than the Prius. They'll say, oh, it's five or 10 miles per gallon better. That's really worth it. And they'll make a mistake and they'll buy something that's too efficient because that five or 10 miles per gallon didn't get you much at all. And then the same thing is true with someone looking at an SUV. One gets 14 and one gets 16. They'll say, oh, they're almost the same. And they buy the 14. That's also a big mistake, but in the, in the other direction because those two miles per gallon were really valuable. Right? So this illusion can sort of work in both, uh, in both ways. And last, uh, on technology, here's where I will try to reserve some, some optimism. So spillovers, of course, this idea that if we can invent something new, if the government can, can subsidize or society can somehow encourage something new, uh, that this technology will really lead to really big savings in the future. Um, I put Ford's new 
EcoBoost engine. I have no stock in Ford, uh, but they're they're sort of leading leading the way really with with a, a pickup truck engine that gets actually quite a bit better fuel economy than even its Toyota uh, competition. We have some algae uh, at the top here. The way this works economically, and, and this this thing in parentheses is important that in the future maybe you can take the subsidies away and we'll still all be using EcoBoost engines and algae. Why might that be? The idea is just cost effectiveness, right? So where does uh, innovation in society go? These days, innovation in society goes to whatever technology is currently cheapest, right? So if a coal-fired power plant is the cheapest way to generate electricity, lots of people are interested in trying to make them a little better, a little more efficient and cheaper. Uh, and so they do that, and coal maintains its dominance. If you can subsidize something like PV or biogas or whatever, to the point that it becomes the cheapest technology, everybody loses interest. The business community loses interest in coal because it's not, it's not the dominant technology. It's not the, uh, uh, what you would build next. And so the innovation goes to the new thing. And that's this, this idea here that if we can subsidize things for a while, maybe eventually they're cost effective. And then the, then the money starts flowing in uh, sort of automatically right there. They're, they become the dominant technology. So that's just a little bit on the economics and, and policy. So thanks. Thank you.